Good everyone. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Everett Public Schools Board of Directors. Our meeting is now called to order. Our Vice President Mitchell will be reading the land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Coast Salish, Snohomish, and Tulalip peoples. We express our deepest respect and gratitude to the ancestors of this land on whose shoulders we stand. In Everett Public Schools, we strive to create equitable outcomes and build a culture of inclusive belonging for all students, teachers, staff, and community. Please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening. Will the secretary please call the roll? President Lassane. Present. Vice President Mitchell. Present. Director Nichols. Present. Director Mason. Present. Director Berg. Present. Student Representative Pilch Besson. Present. Student Representative Colley. Our first item of business is the adoption of the agenda. Dr. Saltzman, would you please introduce the agenda for this evening? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, Board of Directors, and the public. Good evening. Tonight's agenda contains the following. A segment for recognitions, the superintendent's report, a segment for board comments, a segment for public comments, a segment for routine business, a segment for strategic progress monitoring, a segment for information and discussion, a segment for new business and upcoming agenda items. Since publishing the agenda, the following change was made to the agenda. Item 5.01, adoption of the agenda, the timing sheet was updated. Item 8.01, superintendent's report, presentation was added. Item 10.10, .10, approval of interlocal cooperative agreement with the City of Everett and the Economic Alliance of Snohomish County. The agreement was updated. New business items, two policies for first reading were removed. And item 15.03, regular meeting February 2022, the meeting content was updated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Salzman. Is there a motion for the adoption of the agenda? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Director Mason, and it's been seconded by D Director Mitchell to adopt the agenda for this evening. Is there any discussion? Director Berg? Nothing. Hearing no, no discussion, we'll proceed to the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say no. The motion carries. The agenda for this evening has been adopted. We'll now move to the next item on our agenda for this evening, and that is item recognition, uh, item 6.0, which is recognitions. We have a very special, special recognition for this evening, it is the recognition of our past president. It has been an extremely rough couple of years for the district our families and our city. The hallmark of Director Mason's pursuit of leading the board during these challenging times has been her aggressive desires to ensure the safety for most of each student, their families, the staff members at each school, and the administrators in this building and throughout those that are working behind the scenes in our district. Her primary goal has always been ensuring student success and engagement. For the past two years, Caroline Mason has served as president of the board, and for that we are truly grateful. And we would like to take this time to recognize her for her service. Would any other members like to respond? Well, I actually wrote something quite lengthy. Do you yes. mind if I read it? Go right. Okay, so I did a little digging. 
So on behalf of the Everett Public Schools Board of Directors, I would like to extend our serious, sincerest appreciation for Director Mason serving her second term as president. We first elected her president May 8, 2017, upon Director Tendwen to um, releasing himself from that role for, 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 for personal reasons. He stayed on our board for a little bit longer. Um, she was reelected to the board that December and served until the following December when Director Andrews um, was elected to the position. And then December 3rd of 2019, Caroline again was elected by us and has served a total of about four and a half years as board president, for which we're really thankful. Um, not a lot of people in this room um, remember when our meetings used to be um, four to six hours long. Um, maybe some of you do, uh, Director um, Lassane definitely does. Um, but that was something that, that Director Mason really did work hard for, um, just as a, is trying to get only the most essential things um, to these meetings that really, um, our, pub, our, our board meetings need to be in front of the public. And so what is the most essential thing that has to be here um, with regards to the finances and student learning and then left other things up to special meetings and um, other thing, other types of communication so that this could be most efficient um, because the staff here work long days and have to come back the next day and some of us board members work long days. So for that, I am personally thankful. In her most recent term, she has performed other important work to lead the district. She led us through a superintendent search. She worked closely with the consultant and looking at how, what the community sentiment was about what they wanted in a superintendent. And she helped us with the interviews, the selection, and the transition from the former superintendent to this superintendent. She has worked closely with Dr. Saltzman and his team for the first two years of the pandemic. She, like many of us, had a son at home and one in college learning remotely, and she has helped lead the school's reopening. She sometimes she also allows us to have lengthy discussions sometimes um, on sensitive or controversial topics, but she would also help us come to a conclusion. She has led us with compassion and grace. She is a model leader who is willing to hear both or multiple sides and help us either come to consensus or lead us to further perhaps more focused discussions. It takes great skills to lead a group of adults like us with different backgrounds and experiences, as well as lead a district with greater than 20,000 students, thousands of staff, and then their families in the community. Caroline has made it look easy, and we all know it isn't. She has a true love of her family and the Everett Public Schools, and we are all thankful for her years of service as board president and that she will continue to sit beside us. Thank you. Would any other director like to make a comment? Uh, I just want to say thank you for the past two years um, of your steady leadership and um, for the mentorship that you provided coming out of the board. Um, I appreciate all of that and look forward to continuing working with you. Director Berg here <laughs> there quietly. Thank you so much. Um, I think Director Mitchell summed it up really well, but but um, Carol, uh, Director Mason, I'm so sorry I'm not there tonight to be able to just um, give you my heartfelt thanks for your service and your time, your time mentoring me, your time spent on the board and really leading the board. Um, I know we've had a lot of private conversations about leadership and style. And I love, love, love your leadership style. You're direct, you're to the point, you keep us on task and you make us a better place. And during this unprecedented health crisis, I couldn't have thought of a better person, a better woman to be leading us at that time. And I'm thankful that you decided to keep leading us when you, when you could have done other things. So it just shows your willingness to serve the community that you love. And as a result, the community loves you right back. So just thank you for everything you've done. And I'm looking forward to, to serving a, a few more years with you. <laughs> thank you. Student rep. Would you have any words to say? Yeah, I don't have uh, much to add to. Um, I think a, a lot of true things have been said, but um, I'll add that the only version of the board that I've ever known is one that you've been leading. And so um, I've, I really appreciated that uh, strong sense of leadership in my time here. Um, and um, 
while I don't have much to compare it to, I, I think that everything ran extremely smoothly and um, it's just a, a really positive environment to be a part of. So thank you. Thank you. Well, as you can imagine, we do have a gift that we would like to present to Caroline. And would is there someone who would like to take it? Oh, oh, we have photos too. So I would like to provide this. Can we come all down? We, we won't get too close, but maybe in the background, the, the board can stand and we can get Caroline up front. We have a plaque for you, madam. Old oh, gavel. Yes, indeed. You know, we have to go over here to the side. Thank you. 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 I'd like to say a few words, if I may. First, I, I would just like to say thank you to my fellow directors for the incredibly kind words. I am <clears throat> much more comfortable being president and running a meeting than sitting here listening to that, um, mostly because I'm just doing what I love. And it's always, to me, odd to be recognized for something that you get up and you just do because it's what you're meant to do and what you like to do. and. Um, the other thing too, as I was sitting here reflecting is, we all know, I mean, recognitions are great, but it is a team. It is a team that makes all this work happen. And I'm just so fortunate to serve with so many great people who are dedicated and be in a district where there are so many people working so hard to, especially these last two years to make um, the student and family experience a really positive one, given all the, rocky roads we've had to travel. So I want to say thank you to all of you because that's what um, makes what I do so much fun and, and enjoyable. So I appreciate it. Thank you. We now get to move on to the next section, section um, 6.02, which is School Board Recognition Month. And I believe yes. communications is on already at the back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saltzman and Board of Directors. January is School Board Appreciation Month, and we would like to take a moment to thank the board for everything they do on behalf of students. We will start with a short video that is a little different than normal, but that's a little bit how the last year has been. WASDA provided a list of um, school board, a list of things school boards have helped schools navigate in the last 18 months, which is what provided the inspiration for this video we're about to share.
On behalf of the school district, we thank you for all that you do. And there are many others who would like to share their appreciation. And we're going to start with Kay Fanton. I'm going to close this out. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. Wow. And you all have families and other jobs, too. <laughs> that list is amazing. Um, I'm here to speak on behalf of the Everett Public School Foundation and our board of directors and our donors. Um, and we'd like to share how grateful we are for you and the countless hours you spend leading our schools and making tough decisions. As we continue to na navigate through these times, we're even more grateful for the support and extraordinary investment of your time and talent for our students. Our community benefits every day for the dedicated energy and time devoted by you and recognize the countless hours that you put in on our behalf, not only in January, but all year. Um, so we thank you. We have a special gift for you that is somewhere in the past in a truck <laughs> that got stuck. So I will make sure that we get that uh, to you. I was like watching the little tracker and I'm like, not gonna make it, not gonna make it. So we'll make sure we get that to you. Um, but we do want to know that we appreciate your partnership. We appreciate all you do and we couldn't do it without you. And the future of our community, our students, our staff and our schools is better because of you. And next, Craig Willis is gonna share. We do have gifts that got through the past, so. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, hello, my name is Craig Willis. I am the current president of Everett PTSA Council, attending today on behalf of our council board, along with our council treasurer, Mio McGuire, as well as on behalf of our 27 local PTAs in our school district. Although January is school board recognition month, we recognize the hard work and dedication from each of our school board members every day and throughout each year. There is no more evident than during the past two years, during which time our school district has faced unprecedented challenges and our school board has had to use creative and thoughtful decision making to help ensure the overall safety and health of our students and staff members, while also maintaining a strong emphasis on educational support. We appreciate our school board directors for leading by example with grace and distinction. Under your guidance, there has been a noticeable expansion of digital resources for learning and teaching, as well as an increased community outreach. In example, remote learning opportunities such as the Everett Virtual Academy have allowed families an alternative learning option with an added peace of mind. Also, the Let's Connect sessions have provided opportunities for families and community members to stay informed on recent activities and events and topics concerning our district. Additionally, the Parent University's multilingual What Every Parent Needs to Know video series has helped strengthen the importance of family and community engagement. Today, our council is presenting each of you with several tokens of appreciation. Most notably, you're each receiving note cards which show several examples of artwork that were submitted by students in our district for this school year's PTA Reflections program. During the various challenges caused by, despite the various challenges caused by the pandemic, we still received 188 entries from 15 schools in our district, and 38 of those entries are proceeding to the state level of competition for the program. We're very proud of these students. These note cards show a small example of the fantastic creativity and efforts that our district students provide, not just for this program, but every day. So in closing, it is with great appreciation to recognize each of you for promoting leadership, transparency, student learning expectations, student and staff success, and local community engagement and representation within our school district. Under your guidance, we have a school district to be very proud of and which leads by example, just like our school board. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and next up is Kathy Woods. Good evening. It's an honor to be here. 
tonight to recognize you. Um, uh, I represent the Everett um, Association of School Administrators that represents principals, assistant principals, directors, and others uh, throughout our district. And uh, really on behalf of especially our school leadership, our co-president uh, Celia O'Connor Weaver was unable to be here this evening, but sends her great respect and admiration as well. And um, on behalf of those leaders, I just really want to um, give you our deepest thanks and gratitude. I had a mentor who once said this to me. He said, you are going to be criticized no matter what you decide. So just make sure you're criticized for doing the right thing. Yeah. And I've thought about that a lot as I have reflected on this board's leadership and decision making and advocacy, especially in these last couple of years. So you have made um, decisions based on what is in the best interest of our students. Um, and the work of this board is very public and it is very easy for people to sit back and criticize. But I watch you consistently make decisions based on what is right for kids, what is right for our schools, and what is right for our whole community. So on behalf of the Everett Association of School Administrators and my co-president, Celia O'Connor Weaver, I want to say thank you and to let you know how very grateful and fortunate we feel as leaders to be serving in a district with such tremendous board leadership. So we have a card for each of you, and we also have um, a donation that we will be giving in the name of, um, of the Board of Directors to the Everett Public Schools Foundation um, on, on your behalf. So thank you very, very much. And our next um, presenter is Sharla Georges, who is actually on Zoom. Hello everyone, I am Charlotte Georges and I am the secretary of the Everett Association of Paraeducators and I'm a para at Monroe Elementary. Um, I represent paras across the district. Laura um, wanted me to mention that she's sorry she's unable to attend tonight. Um, she had an emergency paraeducator board meeting to attend. Um, many people only pay attention to their local school board when there's a tax vote or elections, but school board members do much more than that. Everett school board members elected by the people are responsible for our community's most precious resource and the key to its future, our children and their educational opportunities. They serve to ensure our community is poised to meet the future with a highly educated workforce. They serve because they believe in the role that public education plays in creating a better community for all of the citizens. Board members spend hours reading materials and digging into reports to prepare for long detailed meetings. Most importantly, school board members are members of the community. They must be prepared to answer questions about district operations at the grocery store, as well as at board meetings. School board recognition month in January is a good opportunity for us to recognize Everett school board members, Pam Lassane, Tracy Mitchell, Andrew Nichols, Carolyn Mason, April Berg, Kara Pilch Bisson, and Bencha Colley for their work. It is our hope that the people in our community will take a few moments this month to take to thank them and to learn more about the work of our school board members who bear the tremendous responsibility of ensuring the long-term success of our school system and of our community's children. As a thank you to our school board members, we have made a donation in your names for $250 to Cocoon House and $250 to Care Solace. Both assist the impacted youth and families of our community. We look forward to another wonderful year with our school board. And next will be Jody Moyer. Thank you so much. Thank you. So much. Thank you so much, Sharla. I am Jody Moyer, president of Everett Office Professionals Union. 
We would like to thank you for all your countless hours of hard work on behalf of Everett Public Schools and Everett community. We know that our students are tomorrow's leaders and your sustained leadership and extraordinary dedication to our students is so clear. Our district is known for excellence and you are a big reason for that because of your contributions. Everett Public Schools is able to continue our mission. The recognition and honors that you receive are evident of the incredible job you do. The Everett Office Professionals want you to know that we really appreciate your support and we have a card for you too. So she's gonna pass those out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jared Kink. I'm uh, president of the Everett Education Association. I represent about 1,400 certificated staff members throughout the district. And it's, it's hard, to, so much has been said already about you. I'm going to take a little bit different tact. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm recognizing your social emotional well being. That often uh, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that people don't see. And in our work, union work often, and in my family, food is love. So I got you a cake, and I want you to think about when you want this cake. I don't want you to go put it in a staff room. Don't take it home and put it in the kitchen and say, oh, here, kids, eat this and hide away. Don't adhere to any of your resolutions. I want you to eat it. I want you to sit, maybe and eat it now on your drive home. I want you to eat it. I've done this before, lobbying in Olympia, April. I get a pie at Wagner's and I just eat that thing on I-5. You do the same thing. Uh, maybe you go home, lock a door, go and watch Netflix and just eat the whole thing by yourself. Because sometimes that's what you need, because this job is tough and that's what I want to recognize. How hard this is that uh, the slideshow, it was wonderful, but I experienced a lot of trauma uh, with some of those things coming up. And you may have, you've been through it all, you see it all, and you've done an amazing job at it. And I often say, you may, you may have heard me say before, I, I think I have the best members in the state, we have the best contract in the state, and I would, it's, you make it really easy to say, we have the best school board in the state. So thank you for everything that you, you do, you've done, your dedication, your commitment, and thank you. So. Thank you so much, Jerry. Thank you so much. Thanks again. And that concludes this part of the agenda. If we have one other have announcement. One oh. Yes, so um, if I could please ask the board to stand, because um, we cannot do our work, honestly, right now, without all of the school administrators uh, Dr. Saltzman on down to the people in this room and the people in every building right now who are filling in for substitutes. Garrett knows the teachers are working phenomenally hard and we think about their social emotional all the time. And all of you in this room who are recognizing us tonight, we stand on your shoulders. We did that long list because of you. Because of you. So we want to recognize you and thank you all. And, and please pass this on to all of your staffs in the building who are leading their buildings and, um, and, and doing this, the, the substituting. So thank you so much. Okay, we're done now. Put up here. Oh, I'm sorry. I was gonna pull up the next. That's thing. quite our. I that's good. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we will now move to section 7.0, which is our superintendent's report. Dr. Salzman, take it away. Okay. Uh, good evening uh, to the board and to the public. First of all, I wonder if someone saw my uh, report tonight before even uh, getting it, but. I, I said I'm for everything. I, before I begin uh, to recognize the board, I'd like to say a few words about uh, former chair Caroline Mason. Okay. Someone asked me if you could describe her in, in four words. Uh, my wife Robin said, how would you describe your board chair? Class, strength, wisdom, and caring. As Russell Wilson said, Pete Carroll has made me better. Caroline Mason, you made me a better leader. Thank you. 
Okay. To the board, like everybody said, we could not have gone through these past few years without you. You're an amazing board. You're an amazing group of people. You are a true team. And uh, I think Jared King said it best, eat that cake because he gave me a pie during the holidays and I ate it on the way home. So uh, <laughs> I take his lead on that all the time. I wish everybody a happy and healthy 2022. It started off a little different, great deal of snow and the Omicron, but 2022 is going to be a good year. And I will ask everybody to please join me and wish everybody the best new year you can have. I want to talk about Monday, January 17th. All schools will be closed to honor the legacy of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. And as a mentor once said to me, the work that Martin Luther King Jr. did was just not one day. The work that he did every day has helped shape our society. His creation of the Civil Rights Act in 1964 was a pivotal beginning for all of us to continue to work together towards equity, diversity, and the inclusion of all. The Sonoma County Black History Committee has several events scheduled, and please go to the homepage for the information. They're going to provide COVID tests Celebration of his legacy in person and on Facebook Live, and free community resources and COVID vaccination vaccines will be offered on that day. So please, as we join together to honor the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and to honor our great community. As we talk about teamwork, more vaccination clinics have been offered. We were able to host another COVID vaccination clinic last Saturday. I'm grateful for the partnerships we have making this possible for our students and our families. It will take everybody to help us beat this Omicron variant. Please, I want to relay that message to our community. It will take everyone. Continue washing your hands, continue wearing masks, and continue social distancing. The next 30 days are going to be a challenge. I don't want to sugarcoat that for anybody. The next 30 days are going to be a challenge in the United States and in our town of Everett. We will get past these 30 days, but it will be a huge challenge. So please be aware and do everything you can to stay safe and healthy. I think Tracy Mitchell and the board said it best to honor the CRC staff. I want to say a few words. Everybody in this building is doing everything to maintain and keep our schools open. You come in here Monday, it's a ghost town. Nobody's here, everybody's out and about substituting. The pandemic has created staffing challenges, as you heard today from our Chris Rydell, our state superintendent. And we're doing everything, teachers, paraprofessionals, offices, lunchroom helpers, and more. And to our teachers, thank you. Just a big thank you. And to our administrators, not only in this building, but in every building that we're having right now, the work that they're doing, it feels like March again, but there's a light at the end of the tunnel. We just have to help each other and support each other in the most challenging times again in public education. But I'm most grateful for the attitudes of every professional in this system. Everybody's trying their best. Everybody's staying positive, and Everybody believes that we'll get through this for the youngsters for the youngsters that's who rely on us. So I want to share this with the community that it's going to be a tough 30 days. Thank you for being with us. And for our team, thank you for staying course. And finally, mm -hmm. robotics is just the domination of great things that happen in our uh, district. So I want to honor our robotics team that we have in many schools. And I'm very proud of what we're doing with robotics because when you talk to other districts, they always say, wow, you guys win a lot of awards in robotics. So salutes to our robotics team. And again, to everybody, make it a great 2022. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Salzman. We'll now move to item section 8.0, which is board comments. And before I mention that, there's one thing that I, I failed to do at the beginning, and that's a closed caption disclaimer. Uh, for those that are zooming in and are online, we are providing closed captions for our meeting. And please note that the disclaimer being displayed on the screen 
is for your um, for your understanding. Please note that um, Everett Public Schools does not review for accuracy and makes no representations or warrants regarding the accuracy, reliability, the timeliness, or the completeness of any information that appears in the closed caption. But it is provided for your assistance. Thank you so much. And and I sorry I missed that at the beginning. We'll now move to section 8.0, which is board comments. Uh, directors, would any of you like to provide comments or share your comments with the board, rest of the board this evening? Let's start at that far end. Student representative, would you care to make a comment? Yeah, you're uh, putting me on the spot a little bit. I think uh, there were there's kind of a lot of things to cover. Um, the first thing I want to say thank you to everyone who came out um, and is sharing appreciation for the school board. I wish that like I had been on the other side of things to share that support for the school board. Um, I think being in this role has, uh, if it's done one thing, it's show me how much work goes into uh, just the six period day that I attend every day. And um, on top of that, if there's anything my high school experience has shown me, it's how much that six period day provides um, for me as a person and for all of my peers. Um, it's just like, there's a, a tremendous amount of appreciation that has come with the past two years. And um, I just wanna thank you all for, because um, two years is like not a, an insanely long time, but it is like coming up on half of the time that I've been in high school at all. So um, it's really the, the hallmark of my experience and um, it's your guys' support that has been able to make that a, a somewhat positive experience. Um, and um, yes, I don't know. I think uh, during Dr. Saltzman's presentation, I want to echo um, what he said about vaccination. I think if there's um, one thing that we can be doing to, well, there's many things that we can be doing, but I think one of the most important and timely things that we can be doing to honor uh, the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is showing up for our community and for our peers. And I think one of the best ways that people can do that right now is to be uh, protecting their community and getting vaccinated and um, just being extremely safe right now. I think that that is the best way to show up for your peers and to promote um, a level of, of care and empathy and love for everyone in your community. So I think that that's really important. Um, and then one other tiny small thing that popped into my head was I see the, like the nothing but cakes boxes over there and two of my best friends work at nothing but cakes. And so I just, I thought that was a cool thing. Support local businesses. Um, well, I guess they're kind of a bigger business, but support our local businesses. And I just thought that that was really cool that my two best friends work there, so. Thank you very much, Tara. I appreciate the words. Well, I'll move to Director Berg. She's on the on the video so we'll allow her because she would normally be sitting right here so she would be the next person in line thank you so much uh president lasane i'm gonna have to get used to <laughs> saying that with all the new positions it's so awesome so um congratulations to you and, and to director mitchell as well and again caroline i'm i'm just i can't thank you enough for your leadership all these all these years um I just, you know, it's been a hard couple of weeks. I think um, this new variant has hit us as uh, leaders, but also our schools, our families really by surprise and really hard. And so um, I just am, I'm encouraged that the message that I'm hearing from families who have um, graciously been reaching out to me nonstop is that keep our schools open. And each and every time I get a call or an email from a family saying and asking that, my answer is yes. And so thank you, Dr. Saltman, for your commitment to keep our schools open. That said, please be safe out there. Um, make good decisions. Keep your kiddos home if they're they're not feeling well or if someone in your family is ill. And definitely take advantage of kind of the, the new program that's set forth by Snohomish County for Martin Luther King Day. Um, it's going to be a great time to connect with community streaming um, and, and going out to get your vaccine or get tested if that's what you needed as well. Um, I was really happy to be able to virtually kind of give a message to some students in our district about MLK and the theme of it was was joy and so I know it's hard to think about joy in the midst of all we're going through but 
hopefully everybody can really keep a theme of joy and happiness in their hearts despite the public health crisis that we're continuing to go through. So that's all I have. Thank you very much, Director Berg. We'll now move to Director Mason. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention one thing as I look out amongst uh, the folks out there, the sea of green buttons, and um, wanted to remind our community that on February 8th, we will have an election for two replacement levies on the ballot. And I think that this is a great meeting to mention that if you watched the uh, short video prior to the school board recognition, you had an opportunity to see the support that the schools have been able to provide both our students and our families for the last few years. Um, some of the items on that list uh, were covered by federal funding, which will eventually run out. And we are looking for our community to continue to support our schools and our students and our families so we can get through this pandemic. And um, you'll see some social emotional supports and you'll also see some funding to have healthy and safe buildings and technology as well, um, which has become so critical during these times, especially during school closures. So I encourage our community to learn more about these two levies. Um, I had an opportunity to drive around today and I saw sandwich boards outside of two schools. I know there's a lot of information online on the website. Um, so I hope that voters take an opportunity to educate themselves on how important and critical these levies are in providing the services to our students and families. And this will be the last time I can mention that before ballots go out in the mail. So by our next regular meeting, ballots will be in home. So I hope that uh, people just take time to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Mason. Director Nichols. So I'll, uh, <clears throat> I'll echo that um, because, you know, we often hear um, from folks that they wish government institutions could be more like big business and pivot and do all these things. And you know what? We can't do that without money. And the reason we were able to pivot so well during this pandemic was because of the funding that we'd received. And I'd love to be able to continue to have that sort of uh, flexibility for our district. Um, and these, these levies are vital for us to continue to do that. It's never fun raising your own taxes. It's, uh, it's not something I look forward to doing, but it is necessary. If I'm gonna pay taxes, this is where I want it going. I want it going to our kids. Um, so that, and then with, um, with Omicron, yes, the next 30 days, 30 to 33 days based on the studies coming out of South Africa um, are gonna be rough. And for a lot of folks, it's, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. Um, and you have a much better chance of not being hospitalized and not suffering long-term consequences of COVID if you are vaccinated and, and boosted. So even if you got your first two shots or just your, your one and done Johnson Johnson, go get the booster. It really does help uh, reduce the severity and length. Um, people ask, well, you know, I can get it anyways if I'm if I'm vaccinated. Yes, but you won't have it in your system as long, which means less time for it to mutate into a new variant that can wreak havoc on our community. So let's keep that in mind and let's stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Director Nichols. Director Mitchell, would you like to make a comment? Yes, thank you. Um, I want the PTA to know I do use these. They go all <laughs> around the country as I um, mail money to my niece and nephew or uh, my uh, uh, second cousin who was an art teacher in schools. She loves seeing the kids art. She loves it when I send these to her. So thank you. They'll be going out shortly. Um, I My second favorite dessert ever is cake. Um, so I will eat cake anytime. Uh, first is ice cream, but um, cake. Um, I just want to thank, I've talked to, um, I have a lot of friends that are our teachers um, in this district and other districts, and my, specifically the friends that are in other districts really wish um, they were in Everett, which is lovely to hear. Um, but what I'm hearing the most is, is it is that substitute shortage, and um, not just the, the, the administrators that are in the schools, but that they're losing specialists to sub for classrooms, and so a teacher at a title school has lost her, her specialist, and it's, it's she's struggling and she said it's, this is the hardest year she's worked in 20 years of teaching and so that that you know you guys are doing what you can and anything that we can do um, when it comes to funding and services and support that's that's what we're, we're trying to do and it's just I know that it's hard and so all the messages about 30 days I will not repeat 
um, all I will just tongue in cheek say that um, I'm pretty sure there were a whole lot of teachers and staff that when all that snow was happening over the holidays said, why is this not the first week of January and or the second week of February? Because they missed all the snow days because I know how much kids and staff love snow days. <laughs> but my last thing is I spent a week looking at colleges, universities in Florida and something that I did not appreciate um, is our agreement that we have with Everett Community College to Washington State University, how that is a seamless transition for students versus um, my nephew who did his community college in Wichita um, and is looking at Florida schools and one of the Florida universities wants two semesters of Spanish before he can before he can transfer in versus another one that he has to get two semesters of Spanish in his four year term. So in his next two years. And so to me, that was a surprise that that not just that it's Florida, but that a public university is requiring a foreign language when I know private universities don't always require it. But the fact that our students do have that direct, but if they go to Everett Community College or a different community college, I it's not our responsibility, but it's sort of you know preparing them for those college requirements that if they don't have those direct transfer programs. So again, just very thankful for our Everett direct transfer program. Um, because that does take away all the surprises for our kids. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have just a short one, and I know I don't want to repeat what other people have already said, but this this is very concerning to me, so I will make this statement. Um, you know, we are also entering into the flu season, and myself as a concerned parent and, and an aunt of a student in the district and a community member, I'm, I'm asking all parents to talk with your children about the importance of attending every single day of in-person school. It, I implore you to get your children vaccinated and to get boosters when they become available for your children and ask them, ask your children to continue to wear their masks properly, continue to wash their hands after every class even, every hour even, whatever, but make it a systemic habitual effort to do so. Uh, as it's been mentioned, it's going to be a tough 30 days. And even though we as parents and adults understand the, the ramifications of not having our children in school, we need to implore our students how important it is to be in class every single day possible. We want each to, to, uh, student to be in their classroom seat learning each and every day. And when they themselves understand how important it is to, to take this virus seriously, take the flu also on top of a virus seriously and how important it is to be in class until we do that they won't see that and they will think we as parents are just harping on them as parents usually sometimes do mm. but i implore you to talk to your students talk to talk to them and say how important it is to be in in-person classroom we hate to have to shut a school down or a classroom down and for kids to go back to virtual learning. We know it's important to be in that seat each and every day possible. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. If there's no further um, comments, we will move on to the next section. This one version. Oh, yeah, that okay. Okay, this is the public uh, comment section. We do this because we value public input, and we want to hear and understand the perspectives you bring to the table. Dr. Salzman, are there any requests for comments? I believe we have one. We have one. Virtual. We have one speaker. Our speaker tonight is. Give it to her. Yeah. Excuse me, I may not have that. Okay. Okay. 
Gotcha. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. We have one speaker tonight online. Jared, would you please promote uh, Jeff Heckathorn to the panelists so they can join us via Zoom? Our guest speaker will need to accept the panelist request to join the meeting. Once you join the meeting, you will have three minutes to speak to the board. At the end of your three min minutes, you will return to the attendee status to view the rest of the meeting. I would ask, I would like you to ask that you keep your camera on so we can see you on our screen. The technology is set to hide non-video participants, so it makes it hard to see who's talking when the camera is off. Thank you very much. You may proceed. Can you hear me okay? Very well. Thank you very much. Good evening. First, I would like to publicly thank Director April Berg for her work on the college and the high school courses. I also want to thank her for abstaining on the board's vote for the EPNO levy. That took courage. I will vote no on both levies. One reason is that I do not trust the Everett School District. I do not think you are being honest and transparent with taxpayers and the public in general. One prime example is how you are presenting a cost analysis on your taxpayer funded website for what you are incorrectly calling an EPNO levy. You pose the question, how much will the levies cost? For the example home shown with an assessed value of $500,000, you show a figure of $420 per year as the cost. Is that supposed to be for year one of the levies or for each of the six years of the levies? You appear to be assuming that the example home for $500,000 does not change value for all six years, but you do assume all other properties appreciate substantially. When I do a logical cost analysis for a $500,000 home, where the home appreciates or depreciates, doesn't matter, in value at the same rate as all other properties, a much more valid assumption, I get $2,000 per year or $12,000 for the six years as the cost. Now, if I compare the previous six years of levies and bond repayments with the future six years of levies and bond repayments, I obtain $621 per year difference. If I include the state school category on our property tax bill, I obtained $910 per year difference. All of the state school category goes to the Everett School District. So no matter how you slice it, the Everett School District is underestimating the cost impact of these levies by 50% to 400%. I invite you to review and critique my analysis at nolevy.com. Thank you and happy new year. Stay healthy. Thank you very much, Mr. Heckathorn. During this public, set, uh, public comment part of the agenda, it's for the board to listen. We don't debate or discuss it, but we would like to thank you and you will be hearing back from the board via email or mail. Thank you very much. We'll now move to the consent agenda, which is item 10.0. Dr. Sossman, would you like to provide an introduction to the consent agenda? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, Board of Directors of the Public. The Board's consent agenda includes repetitive business items, such as meeting minutes, personnel actions, expense vouchers, surplus lists, gifts and grants, and recurring contracts. Sometimes it includes items that occur less frequently but are of a routine business nature. These items are usually reviewed by the Board in the Friday report, one or more weeks before the Board meeting. This gives directors time to ask staff questions or to consider a discussion about the policy implications of those items. The board votes on the consent agenda in a single motion. By its definition, a consent agenda is not debatable. In the case of this consent agenda, the superintendent's office received and answered one question regarding the personnel report. The consent agenda is presented as published for board approval. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Salzman. A motion to adopt the consent uh, agenda as an order. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Director Mason and seconded by Director Nichols to approve the consent agenda. Does any director wish to remove an item from the consent agenda and place it in new business section of the agenda? Hearing no requests, we'll proceed to the vote. 
All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say no. Any abstentions? No. Thank you very mo much. The motion carries. We'll now move to the next item on the agenda, which is our strategic progress monitoring. And tonight we will have a presentation by our chief strategist, Mr. Mike Gunn. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, so good evening. Um, let me get this presentation up on the. All right. So um, tonight I will be providing you a preview of uh, strategic initiative study sessions that will um, occur over the next four months. Um, you may remember that in your annual workshop, uh, planning workshop in August, you had a conversation about taking a number of the um, strategic progress monitoring items uh, from your regular agenda and moving them into study sessions uh, for your strategic initiatives. Um, and so what we've done is um, we have provided those. So we're going to have a uh, uh, work session for you once a month for the next four months. Um, and at each of these st uh, study sessions, we will bring three strategic initiatives to you for your information, and then ask you to um, have some conversations around those initiatives. So it's a way for you to be monitoring the work of the district as well as to be engaged in the work. Um, during the development of our, our new strategic plan, there were actually 27 strategic initiatives that were identified and selected for implementation over the next five years. Um, we went through a process to identify the ones that we would call our first year or phase one strategic initiatives, and, those, and there are 12 of those, and those are the ones that are underway right now. So over the next four months, we'll be bringing three of those strategic initiatives to you at each of the four work sessions. Um, so first I'm going to just kind of give you a real quick reminder of the kind of the structure and the components of our strategic plan. We have our mission and vision. The vision is why we do what we do, and that is because our students will lead and shape the future. The mission is what we do. We inspire, educate, and prepare each student to achieve the high standards, contribute to our community, and thrive in a global society. Um, this slide also has our priority student outcomes, which are the highest level outcomes that we're, that we're striving for in our strategic plan, as well as our core values. Um, this slide and the next slide are the two slides that basically show you the framework of our new strategic plan. Um, I'm going to go from left to right, and then I'm going to go from right to left. From left to right is the priority student outcomes, and again, those are the highest level strategic objectives of our strategic plan. The themes are, I call it high um, operational level um, themes, and then we have objectives, which are, again, I uh, call them operational level, and then the initiatives are getting more to the tactical level work of the district. Um, so now I'm going to go from right to left. The um, initiatives are the tactical level work that we will use to achieve, to make progress on our objectives. Um, the objectives are what we need to do in order to make progress on our strategic themes. And then the themes, um, the themes and the priority student outcomes, by the way, are, were the first products of our strategic plan development. 
that uh, we finished about six months ago. Um, but the themes are directly focused on the priority student outcomes. So, and then the priority student outcomes are uh, meant to be specific and measurable and uh, to directly impact our students in a positive way. The, um, I wanted to point out that the initiatives, there are red ones and black ones, the font color. Uh, the red ones are the first year or phase one strategic initiatives. Those are the ones that we will be bringing to you in these um, four study sessions over the next four months. And then this is the uh, second, uh, the backside or the second page of the framework. By the way, in these study sessions, we'll have laminated copies of this strategic plan framework for your reference during these sessions. So now I'm gonna go through just uh, fairly quickly each of these four study sessions and, and uh, explain to you what you will be seeing at each one. Uh, January 18th, uh, Dave Peters, Joy Grant, and Brian Beckley will be presenting updates on the work that they are, that is underway this year and their strategic initiatives. Um, so the, uh, this is to develop shared practicing practices utilizing social emotional learning, restorative practice and culturally responsive tenets by Dave Peters. Uh, Joy will be covering work around the initiative to implement culturally relevant policies and programs that allow students to see themselves throughout the learning environment. And then Brian Beckley will uh, complete the, the first session with uh, work around the initiative to foster a culture that promotes, supports, and sustains innovative practices. Uh, so that's the first session in um, next Tuesday, actually. Um, then February 15th, uh, mid-February, we will have Callie Spear, Sally Lancaster, and um, Anthony, Anthony Anderson. Anderson. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. We'll be um, presenting information on their initiatives to establish clear and vertically aligned instructional models and frameworks, identify and remove barriers to authentic learning and flexible learning opportunities and choice programs. Uh, a month later, mid-March, uh, Larry Fleckenstein, uh, Kelly Clevenger, and Jeannie Willard will present uh, information on their um, the initiative to establish district-wide expectations for instructional time master schedules and course offerings, uh, secure parent and community support of the academic and social emotional development of, of all students and increase transparency and two-way communication with all stakeholders. And then the third, uh, I'm sorry, the fourth, the final one, in April will be uh, Kathy Woods, Catherine Matthews, uh, Kevin Allen, and Rondi Seberg presenting information on their initiatives to establish consistent grading and assessment practices across all schools and grade levels, um, design and implement effective recruitment and retention plans with an emphasis on diversity and inclusion. And then um, also to ensure an inclusive work environment that promotes wellness, a sense of belonging, engagement, and support. The reason I read all those is because there is a tremendous amount of work going yes. on uh, across the, um, the entire district in all phases of, of those topics that I just mentioned. So, um, so we're really looking forward to it. It should be really uh, informative and uh, engaging. So each of the uh, study sessions uh, has a common structure to it. And this is the structure you see right there. So each of the owners will present information in this order. Introduction and overview, cover with you milestones in the timeline, celebrations and examples of recent work, performance measures around these initiatives, roadblocks, set, setbacks, and risks, if any, they, there may not be any, um, and then next steps that they're planning, and then questions and discussion. And we have structured this uh, for each of the three uh, initiative updates also to have a common format. So first off, we'll, uh, we'll have a little worksheet for you that you can use to take notes during the presentations, and then um, engage in the conversation and we'll first ask if you have any questions for clarification around the work that is ongoing 
and what you and the updates that you heard. Then also reflections on what effect this work will have on achieving our strategic objectives. And then also a very similar question around uh, the effect that this work will have on our priority student outcomes. Um, kind of the gold standard of um, a study session is that where board members will be having a conversation amongst themselves about the strategic level work that they're hearing about. And that's what we're hoping for here. Um, thank you. Uh, there was one other point I wanted to mention, and, and that is that each of the owners, the initiative owners, 12 of them, are presenting to cabinet updates three times a year, this year. So they're presenting uh, every one of them in the fall, and then every one of them in the winter, and then the spring. We have already gone through the fall rotation. So every initiative owner has presented an update to the cabinet this fall. Now we're heading into the winter updates. And one of the uh, aspects of the winter updates is that is uh, pretty much also the presentation that will be um, going to you uh, over the next four months. So by the time you see it in the study session and the initiative owners have already uh, this have uh, will have already brought their uh, information to the cabinet twice for review and discussion around those topics. And that concludes my presentation. Just wanted to, to give you an idea of what you're going to see as of next Tuesday and then for the next three months after that. Director, so student rep, are there any questions? Can I just ask one question? And I'm going to make one statement. I was actually in this classroom. That's Emerson Elementary School, Spanish language, and um, wonderful teacher. Um, I just want to ask, so um, even our special meetings are open to the public. So that one will be open. Um, is that correct? So they'll be yes. videotaped and all that kind of, not video, on Zoom and everything. But for our discussions, because um, we're going to be in one of the conference rooms, social distance, I'm guessing, um, how are we going to be mic so that the community can hear our conversations? I, I believe that the um, arrangements for that meeting are still uh, being Before. developed. Okay. We were planning to have the meeting in the Port Gardner room, but I think due to the recent resurgence of um, COVID and Omicron, I think that we're looking at maybe bringing it back here in this room. Okay, but uh, those details haven't been finalized yet. Okay, I just just want to make sure because of, especially not not as Omicron, but just having that that you know th these discussions in front of the public. But if we're having private discussions, especially with this OMPA and wanting to be completely transparent, that they could actually hear us. The yes, they could hear us. Yes. So thank you. Good idea. Thank you, Director Student Rep. Any other questions? Thank you. Just point of privilege. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's going to be very important these study sessions. This is this is our our growth. This is our plan. This is what we're going to move the system. So uh, I want us to everybody to be engaged because this is our journey for the next five years. And I also want to thank the communications department because you can see many banners that we've gotten that are all through our building, will be all through our community, and all through our schools. So we, we're going to live and breathe not only our mission and vision. But what our strategic plan is. Right. Before we go any further, uh, Director Berg, you're online. Did you have any questions? No, I didn't. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one other question I had, um, Mr. Gunn, will, the, will you be presenting measurable data and also the planned or strategic plan for improving whatever outcomes that you have? So we will not be bringing to you at these updates the um, the performance data on our priority student outcomes. We've been working with uh, Catherine Matthews on how to um, select the the benchmarks and then the targets on that. Um, and we can bring some information to you about where we are in the process. Um, and Catherine's a lot better at this than I am. But I can tell you that. We have put off the um, selection of those benchmarks until the spring assessment data. And that's because we have done a, um, a round of assessments in our schools with our students in the fall, but we need two, uh, two test results that, to feel to comfortable okay. about right. the results. Right. Especially now that we've gone through about a year and a half or so of 
COVID where COVID. there was not a lot mm -hmm. of testing done. The, the concern or thoughts that I had is how are we anticipating any type of remedy or recovery over the summertime? And are we going to be able to be in a position to make those changes early enough so our students and our families get information as to their participation during the summer months coming ahead? Because that could be very difficult in this environment that yeah. we are in right now. Uh, we'll have to um, to get back to you on, on your questions. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so right. much. Right, Our next item on the agenda happens to be the information and discussion section. And that is in, an instructional review summary that is planned. And I see Deputy Superintendent B, Dr. Scott will come forward to present that. Thank you so much. President Lassane, Board of Directors, Dr. Saltzman, we really appreciate this opportunity this evening to present a summary of the Instructional Review 2021. I know our minds are now in 2022, but if we can take kind of a retrospective in 2021 of the, in the fall season. Throughout this presentation, we're gonna emphasize how the instructional reviews, I might slip up and call them IRs in this presentation, just for short, I'll try not to, but um, IRs are instructional views, as you know. We're really um, honing in to the purpose of, and we um, intend to illustrate and, and look at themes around how we're focusing and strengthening the instructional core to improve student achievement. That's what instructional reviews are all about in short. In the end, improving student learning. It's also an opportunity to see climate, culture, and systems at play and showcase throughout the schools and the instructional reviews as well as connections to our strategic plan. So that's what we intend to illustrate here tonight in this presentation. <laughs> we'll begin tonight with a brief summary of the instructional review process. Since you all of you are familiar, this would be a good time to thank you so much for your participation in these instructional reviews. We absolutely value your perspectives and enjoy walking those classrooms with you. Next, we'll dive deeper into an analysis of the instructional improvement themes across levels in schools. And importantly, we're going to discuss the systems of supports mobilized. So it's this it's the so what now what piece, how we're mobilizing around systems of support about what we heard across the system in all 28 instructional reviews and then look at next steps. As I mentioned earlier, in addition to strengthening the instructional core, one of the most important connections we can make in the instructional review process is to our strategic plan specifically how those strategic initiatives, as Mike uh, just mentioned, serve as drivers to achieve our student priority out outcomes, which you can see here on the left. The data that we see in instructional reviews, the data that the principal's presentation at the beginning of the IRs, uh, the data in the classroom walkthroughs, they have significant connections to each of our strategic priority areas, which you can see on the right here. So this strategic planning work complements and it partners with the school improvement planning process and the instructional review, review process as well. Here you can see the anchors, the big why of the instructional reviews. And to recap very briefly again, uh, the purpose and foundations of the instructional review at its roots, the instructional review is a process to better understand teaching and learning in schools as a means to the ultimate end of improving learning at scale. It's a collaborative observation. And Dr. Salzman mentions that all the time as he introduced this process three years ago, that it's a collaborative process. We literally and figuratively sit in a, in a circle or a U shape to listen and learn alongside our colleagues in, in, a, in a posture of support. That's the, that's the name of the game. Um, we visited over 500 classrooms across 28 schools, 500 classrooms. And we made a conscious choice to continue instructional reviews this fall for some of the same reasons we did uh, when we were in full remote in the fall of 2020. We continue them because we believe that leading for instructional improvement and student learning is our highest calling and responsibility. And so a fundamental understanding established by the instructional reviews you can see here 
At the center of the process is equity, leading for equitable outcomes, ensuring each student has access to powerful learning, and then capacity building in the system, improving the skill level of staff by providing feedback and support, and then building understanding and support from the schoolhouse up and not the, not the district office down. You're familiar with the structure here, and just briefly, um, for the benefit of the community in particular, um, the the data it, the, the the data review presentation as the launch of the instructional reviews. This year, we had a specific focus on real time diagnostic data as well as a deeper dive into social emotional learning. I think you saw evidence of that. Um, the perspectives from students, staff, and parents. The classroom learning walks, which are always a big, big highlight for about um, 45 to 60 minutes. And then debriefing uh, glows. These are celebrations. These are all these are the things that we all want to see taken to scale, not only in this particular school, but, uh, but across the system. What we know is high quality, relevant, engaging standards based instruction. And then we debrief grows lands of opportunity where the um, the entire group um, focuses on areas that we would like to see supported towards improvement and that importantly we're here to help assist move forward and then the school-based team huddles briefly to unpack this collaborative feedback and then develops the beginnings of the instructional review action plan as dr scott mentioned in the visits to over 500 class uh, classrooms um, the noticings we took from there were combined into big rocks for each of our schools. And when we did analysis on the district level, there emerged three common themes. Uh, the first was student engagement and social emotional supports. And we've been talking for the past two years about how foundational that is to student success in COVID times. But really, it's foundational to student success in any time. Uh, additionally, um, the second um, big theme or area of focus was tier one and in instructional improvement, the core of our work. And then the third um, big, big theme was using assessment to drive instruction. And we're going to look more closely at each of these themes, starting with the social or student engagement and social emotional supports. So um, in looking at this, I'd like you to start by looking at that picture on the right side. And I'd like you each to just select one of those students and really look at that student and look at their engagement. So you might have selected a student who appears a little more tentative, or perhaps you're uh, selected the one that's trying to mimic the teacher, but isn't quite getting it right yet. Or perhaps you pick the one that is enthusiastically all in and just going for it. <laughs> What's clear from this picture is that no, no matter where the student is on that continuum, they feel safe, they're engaged, they have trust, and they are fully engaged in this classroom activity. And I would say that those elements, those kind of sub themes that, that we classified student engagement and social emotional supports are very evident in this um, picture. You can tell there's a strong classroom culture just from that one snapshot. Uh, I imagine the teacher has strong cultural awareness and gets the trust from the students. There's clarity structure in that academic routines. Um, so those themes that we have up there are those, those themes that kind of fall under um, the category. Getting a classroom to act in this way um, starts by developing that culture. Um, ensuring there's trust and acceptance, creating an environment where students are empowered and comfortable and the teacher is aware of the backgrounds and the assets that each child brings to the classroom. This includes the clarity and the structure of the routines. Students thrive when there is predictability and they are able to establish learning habits. Um, student discourse is another area that we, we um, really represent strong student engagement and social emotional um, supports uh, where students feel safe and can engage in rigorous academic discourse. And then at the high school level too, another um, indicator is, is ninth grade on track. Um, we know that that student success in those first classes in their high school career can really predict their ability to graduate on time and for their college career and life readiness. Um, so each of these elements are important aspects um, under this theme that, that schools selected as their big rocks. <coughs> 
As Dr. Lancaster shared, a major and consistent theme for IR action plans at all three levels was the strengthening of Tier 1 instruction, which is rooted in the explicit alignment of teachers and their team's daily instruction to standards, consistent use of adopted curricula to plan instruction that is vertically aligned, and instruction that builds upon students' foundational skills and fosters access to greater rigor as students progress through subject matter content. One example of our school's actions to strengthen Tier 1 instruction at the elementary level this year is to utilize district support and school-based teacher leaders to provide staff training on the science of reading best practices. This work is essential to achieving our strategic plan outcome to ensure third grade literacy. On the slide is a picture of P5 instructional facilitator Ann Fox modeling for teachers and coaches a Reach for Reading lesson on literacy foundational skills. Another focus within instructional review action plans address our strategic plan outcome to increase math achievement and close achievement gaps. Our, learning, our elementary schools are implementing the illustrative math curriculum this school year, which now vertically aligns our math curricular K-12. With the support of district facilitators and building coaches, elementary teams are aligning their Tier 1 instruction with the math instructional model launch, work, and synthesize, with a focus on instruction that increases student conceptual understanding and utilizes math discourse and visual learning strategies. In the photos seen here on the slide, elementary instructional coaches are provided training specific to the instruction and support of the math curriculum that they will bring back to their schools to train teacher teams with timely professional development. In addition to our instructional coaches, administrator and teacher implementation leaders of the new math curriculum from each school participate in regular math and professional development meetings that support the teacher's implementation. Um, the picture below is a picture from Penny Creek Elementary of a math implementation leader and their grade level collaborating on a Friday afternoon around the math materials and instruction of the illustrative math curriculum. A final theme within improving Tier 1 instruction um, from our IR action plans was the focus on using data to plan Tier 1 instruction and respond to student learning needs. These actions directly relate to our strategic plan outcome to close learning gaps among student groups. By using our curriculum-based assessments and assessment tools, such as iReady and Performance Matters, teams work collaboratively to plan for instruction that differentiates to address student learning gaps. At the elementary level, this work utilizes our Tier 1 push-in model of student support and intervention via our LAP program and MML supports within each classroom. Presented here is a photo of the push-in model of support in action in a first grade classroom at Forest View Elementary during an instructional walk in December. So we've learned a little bit about the what it is we do in an, in an instructional review and the so what, which is why this is important to us, but it finally leads us to the now what. What do we do with the information we've gathered and what are our next steps? So we'd like to share a little bit more about how we're coordinating our support systematically, continuing to build our instructional capacity of our staff with that real focus on tailoring student supports. So in our now what, buildings and central office staff are working together to take the next steps to really support student learning and growth. Using the data and information we, that we have gathered through the instructional review process, our directors and facilitators are engaging in cost neutral supports, focused professional learning sessions tailored to fit the needs of the students who are identified. For example, here you can see in this first picture, um, an image of the collaborative team of secondary special educators who are diving deep into the general education illustrative math curriculum to learn how they can better support their students with individualized education plans in engaging in grade level and math content with a focus on student discourse. In the second photo, you can see that we're also continuing to provide side-by-side -side coaching with data analysis, collaborating with building leaders and their leadership teams, and using the school-specific student data to inform their instruction. This kind of site-based um, site -based coaching has been critical in helping our building leaders to continue to support their action plans with specific strategies for academic achievement and student growth. 
So in addition, our responses to our post-instructional review has been to focus on building coaches' skills and capacity building, um, building student coaches' uh, capacity building and working alongside their classroom teachers using both push-in models as well rather than a pull-out support with paraeducators and coaches. We're de continuing to develop the key strategies for differentiated tier one instruction using small flexible groups where students receive more tailored instruction to meet their needs. This allows our system to support and increase staff capacity to meet the needs of each learner and to continue to really focus on that strategic objective of establishing personalized learning opportunities for all students. We've used the feedback from schools to also focus on our support for tier one and tier three support, tier two and tier three supports, developing resources for helping our students who need greater intervention, but may need more assistance front than an individualized plan the classroom teachers are, are providing. This may mean for some students who are identified, perhaps as multi-language learners or students with individualized education plans, that we're developing better systems to support through more push-in supports. So finally, as our students are working with their site-based data, they're individualizing those instructional experiences for students. So for example, six of our elementary schools completed a seven-week after-school literacy intervention, the Springboard Collaborative, which focused on foundational reading skills building in partnerships with families. Our individual buildings are continuing to enhance learning opportunities by implementing evidence-based activities and interventions to meet the comprehensive needs of all learners. And finally here as sort of a bookend in the presentation or the takeaways or the next steps application from the instructional reviews is really anchored in the strategic plan work, specifically in the initiatives that we'll hear about uh, this winter and spring and, and Mr. Gunn mentioned earlier in those uh, strategic plan study sessions. We're looking forward to that. Some sampling here with, with specific connections to what we saw and heard in, in the thematic analysis in the, in the instructional reviews. Clear and vertically aligned, culturally responsive instructional models and practices, consistent and equitable assessment and grading practices, building on social emotional learning best practices, uh, allowing students to see and be themselves through the learning environment and then removing barriers to authentic learning. Those are the core anchors and connections um, from the thematic uh, uh, analysis to our strategic plan that we'll unpack uh, uh, in more detail uh, this winter and in spring. Thank you all again, and we welcome your questions and discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Scott. Yes, can you, you bet. stop share? Thank you. Now, uh, directors, would anyone like to comment? I see uh, Director Mason would like to make a comment. Yeah, th thank you for the presentation. I always like seeing the roll up. You go to the individual schools and it's nice to see sort of how it all comes together. Um, I'm going to ask you kind of a, what I think is a bit of a tricky question. How would a director understand um, at the end of the school year how we're making progress on instructional strategies in our in our district so um, one thing and i'll just give a little bit of background in my question um, I, you know i've i've often gone to the same school year after year after year um, and each time it feels like a fresh you know, IR, instructional review. There's not a lot of, to me, continuity from the year before of where the year ended up and then the jump to the next year. And then there's so much disruption, even in a, a good year without a pandemic, um, between new leadership at a school, new teachers coming on board and, you know, being a little green in their practice and, and learning sort of the Everett way and, and just their profession. Um, and then, a lot of teams, grade teams for the, the PLCs and such change year over year. Mm -hmm. how, how do you monitor this as a director to understand where we're making progress? Yeah. yeah, I think it comes down to growth from point A to point B to point C. So a couple of examples that we'll be able to see in the spring 
our growth on the on the iReady diagnostics from fall, winter to spring. So those are really a drill down standards based unpacking. In fact, pages and pages of reports, not only for our teachers, but for our parents. And the idea for for um, teachers and administrators and counselors to really sit down with folks, particularly for students who have not yet met standard, to really look deeply at those core essential skills, standards, performance expectations, to shine light on the gap, but also in a spirit of hopefulness that we, that, that gap can be mitigated through these core instructional practices and investments and we tried to really distill it down at somewhat of a high level what those big levers are we have a lot of grant money uh, involved in 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 um, investing in those in those core level levers tier one instructional improvement um, really honing in on what the science of reading is word study um, our, our alignment in our mathematics program so as far as your question uh, Director Mason about how the board can engage there too is really just to see growth over time and celebrate those the, the areas of growth over time because those those initial point A's are different at different schools and right and the hills are have a steeper slope um, at, at many of our schools yeah it's a, yeah it's a challenge a yeah. little bit but yeah. I appreciate your response thank yeah, you. you bet. Are there any other questions or comments from directors and student rep? I have a couple of questions. Yes, Director Mitchell. Um, I know we took down the slides, but it's slide number 15, the third bullet, allowing students to see and be themselves. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering about just turn a phrase to see versus to be to be seen. Because I think that that feeling of being seen really does help with social emotional versus what, what are they seeing? So that's, I guess that's my question is, is that turn of phrase just see and be themselves versus allowing the students to be seen. See and be seen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I mean, I know it's just a slide, but it's a, a turn of phrase. I'm just wondering the purpose of the word see in there. Is it for them to see themselves? Because that's really hard for kids to see versus to be seen mm. by others which really does help with social emotional, that, that oh, adult absolutely. communication. Yep. And in fact, that's verbatim Joy Grant's um, instructional initiative that she's okay. going to be unpacking in January. So we'll have an opportunity in, in pretty quickly, actually, uh, next week, actually. Uh, uh, <laughs> stick it up on us. Yeah, to really look at what that language of the initiative in order to achieve allowing students to see themselves in the learning environment. The B, I think we inserted for the purposes of this position, and, and it no, be, it's, it's, be, be their whole selves yeah. as they bring and have their whole selves be valued in, in their learning environment yeah. by their peers, by their teachers, by, mm -hmm. by the school mm -hmm. culture. Yeah. yeah, and so that's, so it is, it's, it's letting them see the learning environment and be themselves yes. during the learning environment that's right. versus what I'm thinking social emotional, it's that be seen so that we, you know, I know, I see you, Peter, Mm -hmm. I see how you're doing mm -hmm. versus Peter, keep going. You know, it's it's that different, it's just a turn of phrase, but I think it gets that connection. But anyway, yeah, thank you. Second question is more for um, Dr. Lancaster about the um, you use the the phrase for those those little kids, um not yet. And um, I know that Dr. Saltzman gave us the book, you guys did the study session, the Heath and Heath on Switch, and I had the yeah. pleasure pleasure absolute pleasure of reading it over this break and um gave an example of a school in the southeast that um a, a failing school and a new principal and she didn't like d's and f's she changed the grading to not yet with that thinking of a kid who fails algebra says i'm done with algebra versus no you haven't gotten it yet and i'm wondering you use that term not yet i'm wondering how much we do use that wording especially in development of kids, it's not that you can't read, you just can't read yet. And I just, I found that very powerful, that turn. And so I'm wondering, um, it looks like Shelly wants, has a comment too, but I just wonder how much, how much are we trying to embrace that? Or is that really a educational standard or not yet? Uh, the phrase, the power of yet, we talk about that. It's, it's kind of fundamental to establishing a growth mindset. 
and letting students know that um, uh, learning isn't just something you're born with, it's mm -hmm. something that everyone can acquire and just people hit that at different times and points in the continuum and need different supports to get there. Uh, so, uh, and one of the things when um, I share my strategic initiative on February 18th, we'll be talking about kind of asset based language that kind of ties into that not yet that if you start with student strengths, um, you, you can um, take them a lot further than if you start with what they um, their deficits or, or where they need to go. So yeah, I, no, I that, that book talked a lot about that. It's like, you know, if, if, if you're already if you're already part way up the hill, it's a lot easier to get rest of the way up the hill than to show them at the bottom of the hill. Absolutely. Yep. OK, I made that up just right now, but that's what the analogy <laughs> was. But thank you so much. I thought this was very helpful. Director Burke, do you have any questions or comments? Um, I guess I have a, kind of a question and a comment. Um, and so, yeah, Peter, thanks for staying up there. <laughs> um, I So I get, and it's kind of to what Director Mason was asking, because I, I love the IR, I love the process. And I especially love this year being able to refer to notes from years past. Um, and I was just kind of happy that I had kept those notes, right? Seeing seeing what I had thought, what my thoughts were one year, what the growths and the glows and big rocks were. But I'm wondering if there isn't a more systematic way. I think when the principals do that first overview, they do a good job of saying, you know, here's kind of how we've come. But I wonder if there's not a, if there's a way to actually say, you know, 2020, these, this was literally the list of grows and glows versus the next year. Cause I just feel like it's, it's a running tally. And I think some schools are doing phenomenal and they, they, you know, they choose their three rocks and they, they knock them out of the way. And um, there was a couple of schools where I felt like, gall haven't we talked about this <laughs> like we've I, like i know we've talked about this and then i didn't really feel I, I felt a little bit like we as a as a community of of educators and policy leaders weren't necessarily being heard um so is there a way to get more of a um specific tracking year over year for that there's absolutely a way and we keep track of the instructional review action plans every year and there, there is a level of comparison. Um, and what we could be more intentional about, Director Berg, I think what you're asking for is a kind of a retrospective on, uh, this is what you heard last year. If you were here, this is what you heard last year as our big rocks. This is the progress made. And we're either building on those things and, and making substantive uh, change, change in direction, seeing the, the fruit of that labor, um, or, or redirecting course and, and focusing on, on certain things that have taken priority. So, yeah, I think that's, I think that gets at, um, honoring what's been done and then looking forward to it being additive to, 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 um, that year's instructional review action planning. Yeah. And that would be perfect. And I think that my other, um, kind of, um, <coughs> Quest would be to keep it really simple. Um, I find that what I like about the process is that I understand it as a layperson, and I think our end user, both students and parents, right? That's the goal: is to, to get our students better, to make sure our families are more engaged. To that's, I mean, that's that's game ball, right? Like just having our students grow year over year. And what I realize is there's a lot of concepts that um, that probably aren't really user friendly if somebody were to look at it and say that. So, so if we could just make it super simple for walking in here were the rocks here weren't um this is where we got to because i think the other piece of it thinking back to um that slideshow we had at the, for the recognition you know there was a lot of the words on those slides that we didn't even know pre-covid i mean if you really think about it like our families and stuff and so what i'm finding myself is just kind of caught up in in kind of the jargon and the irs kind of illustrate that because i think everybody's putting on their best their best foot forward but it it sometimes you can get lost in that. So just a, a question for simplicity and, um, and consistency as we move forward. Can I add to that too, because it is also um, a little bit of accountability, but not in a punitive way, but in a celebratory way of this is, this is what we did and this is what we haven't done yet. And this is what we're adding to it. And because especially, I think we do, we need a way to articulate when we are in the grocery store, when we are talking to our neighbors when we're talking to our friends, what, why we're doing so great, or what really are, is holding us back. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you. Scott. 
I know we have on our schedule, because we have no unfinished business, but I know we have on our schedule a break. Um, directors, do you wish we were almost 30 minutes ahead of schedule? So just keep going. Do you wish to continue on and, and you can take your break at home? <laughs> <laughs> Or rather, Director Bird can take her break where she's at <laughs> after the meeting. We'll now move to section 14.0, which is new business. And I see uh, Mr. Fleckenstein has already uh, come to the podium. Our, our first policy revision um, under consideration tonight is policy 3409, students with diabetes, life-threatening allergies, asthma, and seizures. The proposed revisions are to comply with House Bill uh, 1085 uh, that promotes a safe and public school learning environment for students with seizure disorders or um, an epilepsy condition. This particular revision uh, now requires seizure response training for school staff and any parent-designated adult who will care for a student with a seizure or epileptic dis disorder following their individual health care plans. Are there any questions? We shall move this to second reading. Thank you very much. Our second proposed revision this evening is policy 3416, medication at school. Also to comply with House Bill 1085, the provisions of uh, revisions here in this policy um, is about the impacting the administration of medications at school, uh, removing language requiring a school nurse to administer nasal sprays while on premises and summoning emerg emergency medical services when the spray is administered. Um, specifically, the nasal spray to address a seizure or epileptic disorder is a controlled substance. Uh, and would be um, part of a doctor's order in an individual health care pl care plan. This is just really being very specific about how we handle uh, moving forward, if approved, the way that we um, treat the nasal uh, spray administration and following the health care plan about who administers that uh, when a, a situation would occur. And the revisions here in policy are specifically uh, on page two, referencing the change in law. Would this also um, be relevant to EpiPens as well, or um, is this just nasal spray? Yeah, specifically, this is uh, in reference to uh, students having a seizure disorder or uh, an epileptic condition. Um, I'm not aware that uh, an EpiPen is um, a, a, a treatment option, an emergency treatment option for those conditions. Okay, I, I just want, because that's... Are there any other questions? Can we move this forward to second reading? We shall. Thank you. Peter. Thank you so much. We'll now move to section 14.03. Superintendent, uh, you would like to make a, a Yes, a thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, Board of Directors of the Public. Uh, you will see tonight the proposed regular meeting schedule for the 2022-23 school year. The structure of this draft follows the pattern of meetings on the second and fourth Tuesdays of the month. There are some months that we only have one meeting, in which case the second or fourth Tuesday was chosen. You'll notice that we've added some work study sessions on this draft, and those will be assigned to year two of our strategic plan initiative reviews. I have a question regarding April of 2023. Um, two questions. One, why do we not have a meeting um, earlier in the month, which would um, the second 
Tuesday would be the 11th, and I believe that's the week after spring break. And then why was the work study and the regular meeting switched compared to all the other months, just out of curiosity? So that is because in years past, once if we have the meeting the, the second week of April, the week after spring break, all of the prep work that goes for the meeting happens before the break. And so this year we're proposing that that happens on the fourth Tuesday of the month so that we all that prep work can happen um, when you return a lot more yeah that makes concisely. sense thank you for that clarification and then that is why the work session is on the third week so that you still have those two times together but that work session is um, connected to the strategic plan initiatives that will be coming before you next year like the second round of those is that helpful mm -hmm. okay okay are there any other questions regarding the schedule changes or the meeting schedule? I guess, um, you know, just going back to the 18th and the 25th, what's unusual is that, you know, you have two meetings. So the 25th of, wait, I got to go back to my, uh oh, I lost my, hang on. I want to look at the calendars. Yeah, you have. It really crunches the regular meetings. Um, well, I guess that's two weeks apart. That's fine. Right. Okay. So if it'll be Versus... about a month between March and April, if we put that April meeting on the second week, it would be about a month between April and May. Right. So yeah. it's it doesn't matter. It's a okay. Wash, Thank really. you. Are there any other questions? Now, do we just approve this or do we move this to second reading? Yeah, this is first reading, so. First reading. First, so we just move this to second reading. Okay. Is if, can we move this to second reading by general consent? We shall. This will be moved to second reading. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, Director, oh, I'm sorry, Director Berg, did you have any questions regarding the meeting schedule? We shall now move to upcoming agenda items. Dr. Saltzman. Thank you, Madam Chair, Board of Directors and the public. On the January 18th special meeting, the Board of General attained the Strategic Progress Monitoring Session 1. On January 30th, 22, at the January 3rd special meeting, the Board of General will attain the legislative conference that will be taking place. The regular meeting on February 8th, 2022, at that meeting, the following will be two policies for second reading budget development update, student representative selection committee board representation, and the December financial report. Thank you very much, Dr. So, Salzman. Just a question, um, yes. just uh, regarding the meeting on the 30th, um, yes. that is uh, all virtual now? Virtual right yes, now. Yes, yes right now, virtual. So do we need to publish a meeting if? Go ahead. I don't know. We, I don't we, think so, but we'll find if out. If we have sure. five, we will because it's virtual. We'll find out. Yeah, because we're technically not interacting or or. I will double check. Potentially not even in the same Zoom at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll double check for the board. Okay, thank you. Good. That was my. We'll question. get back to Friday. <laughs> we're all sitting on the same page, which is very good. Fantastic. We'll now move to section sixteen. Point zero one, which is an executive session where we're not planning to have an executive or a closed session after this meeting. So we'll now then move to section 17.0. This will now conclude the business scheduled to come before the board of directors during this meeting. And this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you Thank very you. much, everyone. Thank you. Go home and have bread. Hey, April. And cake. I want cake. And cake, yes. Cake. <laughs>